I think the possibility of infinite universes is an idea worth having in your toolkit because A, it naturally emerges from a variety of ideas, from the inflationary theory to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, so it may be true. And if it is true, it completely changes the landscape of reality. If the universe is infinitely big, then you can pretty much prove mathematically that there'd be infinite copies of us out there, one after another after another, sometimes having exactly the same conversations, sometimes having slightly different conversations. That's a crazy idea. You can absolutely talk about this idea seriously if you're willing to make an assumption. And that assumption, you should realize, could be wrong. The assumption is, does space go on infinitely far? Or could it be that you go out sufficiently distant and you maybe circle back to your starting point as would happen on the surface of the Earth? We don't know the answer, but under the assumption that space goes on infinitely far, you can argue convincingly with mathematics that there would be copies of us out there. Connections between the different universes depends on the flavor of the multiverse that you look at. If you're thinking about an infinitely large universe, then yeah, in principle, you could start here and in principle, you could pass through those universes if you had enough longevity and if you could travel fast enough. But there are other versions of infinite universes, such as that from quantum mechanics, where you really couldn't jump from one universe to another. That's not the way that version of the multiverse emerges. So it's completely dependent on the flavor of multiverse that you're interested in. In the conventional approach to the Big Bang, which often goes under the name of inflationary cosmology, we imagine that there was a little tiny pea-like sized part of space that was filled with a certain kind of cosmic fuel. It's called the inflaton field. Name doesn't matter, but this fuel gives rise to powerful, repulsive, Gravity. That's a weird idea. We are used to gravity that's attractive. You drop something, it falls to the earth because the earth and the object attract one another. We have never directly experienced repulsive gravity, but Einstein's equations from general relativity say that it is real, that it does exist. And so imagine you have a little pea-like shape that's filled with this fuel that gives rise to repulsive gravity causing it to rapidly swell, to blow apart. That's what we think may have been the Big Bang. And so yes, everything would have started from an incredibly small but dense, highly energetic starting point that gave rise to the Big Bang. We can use the inflationary theory together with our understanding of the electromagnetic force and the nuclear forces, we can use powerful computers to simulate what the universe will look like after this rapid swelling. And we understand the formation of stars and galaxies, not in every detail by any means, but we can understand the processes well enough to get a sense of what the universe should look like on its largest of scales. And amazingly, while we don't have all the details, what our computers predict is pretty close to what we see. And that's an amazing achievement. No one knows what happened before the Big Bang. No one even knows if the concept of before is relevant when you apply it to the Big Bang. I mean, before obviously is relevant to what was I doing before I got here today or what was I doing before the election? You know, a couple weeks ago, all those notions of before make sense. But the Big Bang may be the moment where time itself began. And if that's the case, to talk about before the Big Bang would be to talk about a time when there was no time. And so it'd be an incoherent notion. That's one possibility. The other possibility is sure, maybe the Big Bang is an interesting event, but not the beginning of time not the beginning of everything. Maybe the Big Bang is an interesting realm in which the universe swelled rapidly. That's what we mean by the Big Bang. But maybe the universe existed before that. Maybe there were other Big Bangs that happened before that. Maybe there's a whole prehistory leading up to the event that we call the Big Bang. 
As of today, nobody knows which or if any of these perspectives is correct. In our theories, mathematical theories, we always assume that there is time from the get-go. We don't even know how to formulate physical laws without assuming that time exists. So our mathematics gives us no insight into whether there is an origin to time or whether there might even be a realm where there is no time, there is no space, and only when the ingredients in that realm that we can't fully describe, when they arrange themselves correctly, then space and time as we know them emerge. We don't know if that's a sensible way of thinking about reality, but it certainly is a compelling one to imagine that as a possibility. Time could certainly be a human construct. Time could be something that we impose on the external world because it allows us to organize events. And when we can organize events, we can find coherence, we can find patterns, we can describe it all mathematically. But sure, can I imagine that we encounter some alien civilization in the far future and their conception of reality doesn't involve time at all or maybe as fundamentally as our conception does? That they organize events according to a completely different framework? that does not involve moment after moment after moment, that their experience is not felt as moment after moment after moment as our experience is? Can I imagine that? Yeah, I can. Every physical process, by and large, except for you know, very unlikely events results in an increase in entropy for the basic reason that entropy is simply a measure of the number of ways that a given system can be realized. And if there are more ways that a system can be realized, it's more likely that that configuration will come to be. And so over time, entropy increases at every level at the level of molecules, at the level of living systems, at the level of the universe. Now, it may not always seem that way because we can do things that seem to decrease the amount of entropy, decrease the amount of disorder. We can order a system using our brains and using our volitional capacities, but if you take into account the amount of entropy that our bodies create in the process of yielding that ordered system, then the overall entropy always increases over time. Yeah, when I think about the dominant forces at work guiding the cosmic evolution, I do think of it in terms of entropy and evolution. Entropy is this drive toward ever greater disorder. Evolution is this drive toward ever greater refined systems that are able to replicate with greater capacity. And so they kind of seem like at opposite ends of the spectrum. Entropy driving us toward disorder, evolution in a sense driving us toward order. Now, in a sense therefore, these two forces, they kind of battle against each other during the unfolding of the cosmos. Ultimately, entropy wins. If you look at the far future of the universe as we can understand it using our mathematical equations that describe the laws of physics, it's pretty clear that every ordered system in the universe ultimately decays. Stars ultimately run out of nuclear fuel and either explode or turn to a, a simmering, smoldering mass. They lose that beautiful ordered structure that gives rise to heat and light that comes out of a star during its living system. Even black holes. Ultimately, Stephen Hawking taught us that mystery they... Mystery of black holes. A big mystery of black holes, but there's some aspects that we understand well. And Stephen Hawking taught us that black holes emit radiation slowly, but they emit radiation over time. So their configuration ultimately gives rise to a bath of particles, disordered particles that waft through the universe. So every system that may embody order at a given cosmological epoch, ultimately disintegrates, falls apart, gives rise to a disorderly end product.